All right, guys, welcome to the last talk of today. Um, afterwards, as a reminder again, we'll gather at the entrance hall and then we'll leave together to the party venue. Now, I'm going to introduce to you Mimi Beltrama instead of Anna Tudor, and he will talk about data driven designs, specifically in prototyping. Enjoy his talk. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Uh, I'm Mami, not Anna. Uh, you probably realize that. And um, there is the word design there. So actually, I, when I pitched the talk before the conference, uh, it was meant to be in the design track. And now it's in the um, tech track. But design is too important to leave it up to designers. So this is a great opportunity. And I, because you're all the geeks, I came prepared. <laughs> so, <laughs> suit it up extra for you. Okay. My name is Mabel Trame. Uh, I make things easy and fun to use. I have an own small agency where I do strategy and prototyping. So I am doing really a lot of actionable work people really can go through what I design. And I teach interaction design um, in, at the Schule für Gestaltung in Bern. Now, <laughs> it's 2014 and modern web design is really, really broken. There is one tweet that summarizes it perfectly. It's this giant image, catchy headline, content, fill in later. So this is the state of a lot of web design as they are uh, projected. So uh, if you look at all the templating uh, things, they're all, they work with this pattern. And there is two fundamental things that are, that are uh, broken here. And they have all to do with function and data. So if you look here, there is no, f there is no function. And honestly, there is also no data. There is just nothing. And we can't design like that. We don't design like that. We want function and we want data. So this talk is about designing for use and designing for scale. Okay. A few years back, I was asked to do the intranet for the Swiss Agency for Development and Com uh, Cooperation. So that's a federal uh, bureau in Switzerland, and it has offices all over the world. It has offices in developing countries, employees all over in regions with low bandwidth, with um, very primitive infrastructure, and intranets are not known for being lightweight, fast, and easy to, to, to explore. So they got the assignment to have the internet, the, the most important news um, pages of the internet on mobile exactly for those countries that have low bandwidth, where you not necessarily have a, a computer to, at your disposition, and where things have to be really, really easy to, to, to be accessed. And these people were scared. I met them and they were super, super afraid that the project they were about to do was the same catastrophe as the internet they, they knew already, that it was unusable, it was filled with junk, and it was just not what they needed. Um, I had been doing prototypes with Balsamic and other like um, visual prototypes for a while and I was feeling, ah, this, this doesn't, this, this will not work. I can't show them a PDF with Balsamic um, iPhones on there. That, that's, that's not, that's not good. That's, that's gonna that's gonna crash. And then I made my first prototype in HTML and CSS. 
I had done websites before, but as a prototype, that was the first thing. And the moment they held this thing in their hand, I will never forget. It was like, yes, it's exactly what we want. And they could touch it, they could scroll, they could tap on the news, they could read it. It was exactly what they wanted without having spent thousands and thousands of, of francs. So this was done on my, on my laptop with very little resource in, in very short time after some very basic research. What do you need? What do people have to do? What of the whole internet thing do you actually have to, 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 to have there? And they started to, to pull together data and show me, OK, we need this and only this. And that approach, use data, use real data, and use data so that it is actionable, that people can touch it, and it does what they mean. That was like the, uh, that was like an epiphany. So, users love their data. They don't, l they don't love dummy copy, they love what, that what matters to them. And that's extremely important to find out. That's the first step of doing a great prototype. Finding great data that you can use that users recognize and can act upon. Users don't relate to dummy data. That's just, that won't happen. So what is, what is going on here? So with, with, and what is going wrong here? And not only with this, but also with uh, responsive design and mobile first and multi-device ready design. It's all great. We all need that. It's, it's great. Do that. I don't say don't do responsive design. It's a load of crap. It's great, but it's not enough. And the reason why it's not enough is it focuses on the delivery, how things are delivered. Not what is delivered, but how it is delivered. And that's broken. We should focus on what instead of how. Digital media attempts to, to adapt to different uh, devices. Actually, it should adapt to individual ro user roles. It, it should adapt to individual needs and behaviors. And in the design process, the design process should reflect that. If it doesn't, it's not good enough. And the key to that is data. The key to that is having the data and knowing when to use it. Hence, data-driven design. So now the presentation starts. <laughs> Lengthy introduction. It is sort of a new discipline. It's, I, I really like the picture of the guy um, juggling the plates because, yeah, well, actually, it's a lot of plates to juggle. It's much, much more different than the, the focusing on the delivery is focusing on what to deliver. And the point of uh, data-driven design is to simulate everything users can do with data. And function, that's the function part, function works with data. If you don't have data, you, you can't do functions. And there is a lot of functions. What can users do with data? They can read it. That's the most obvious. That's the delivery part. But they can enter new data or they can edit and change existing data, they can delete data, they can undo what they deleted by mistake, and they can search and filter data, and they can combine data. There's a lot of, just these are just really basic actions people can take on data. And we want to have designs that reflect that. We want to have designs that show the users we care about your tasks. These are tasks people have to perform. 
So a few uh, design-driven, uh, data-driven design scenarios. These apply, these are extreme cases and I will show you a few of them. And the, the approach of not using real data and not using a lot of real data goes well until it doesn't. Until the customer comes with needs that just overwhelm you. And then you should be prepared to have what I, I will show you. A lot of different data, sorry, oops. A lot of different data. This means data in various um, forms. A, a great example is conferences. If you were to make an app or a website, a generic web application for conferences, you would have things like um, sessions, participants, uh, locations, and I'm not talking about conferences like this one. This is a nice conference. It's, it's, it's got two tracks, but if you have something like the World Worldwide Developer Conference with a lot of tracks and a lot of sessions, a lot of participants, you will have to think about including data in your designs. I will, I will show you what that means in terms of magnitude. A second scenario is similar data, like projects that have a lot of data that is similar, and to you as a, uh, as a designer or as, as a person not involved, it doesn't make much sense, but to those people that are using the data, it very well ma makes much sense. I will show examples for that. So a lot, of, a lot of data with small differences that have uh, differences that really, really matter. And also, that's, that's somehow part of the second one, a lot of domain-specific data. So if you're going to make um, a website for dentists, you want to make sure that you have the right data that dentists will want to see and uh, that is appropriate for, for them, for that audience. And especially if it's a large website, you can't reuse the same three sentences all over. It distorts the, the, the feeling of the website totally. A lot of data I showed that, that will be something like a, a, um, an event application. Now, this is the, the, the um, clients work in Excel. That's a fact. Just when, when data, when large data comes from clients, it comes in Excel. And we should embrace Excel. It sounds weird, but I did, and I, I made my work, workflow extremely efficient. I will show you. And in this case, this is the participants of, a, of an, uh, an event with 3,000 participants. That's a lot, but okay, we can live with that. But it's not only in one dimension, it's in the other dimension. Every participant has potentially 80 parameters that can be filled. Now, that's a lot of data, especially if you have to find people. If you have to go through the data and find um, find, for example, you have, a, you have a contact, you want to, you have an emergency contact you have to assign to all the Spanish speaking people that live in Hotel Belvedere. So find the Spanish pe speaking people that live in Hotel Belvedere. Now you need a really, really smart way to filter out uh, these roles. And not as a developer, as a user. Keep in mind, users have to do that. They, wanna, they don't want to phone the agency and, can you please make an export of all the Spanish-speaking uh, people living in, uh, in Hotel Belvedere? This is uh, the, the morning of, of an event, a mid-sized event, and what I want to show you is these are Events that have events that have nested tracks, 
So like the main session is the short papers on vascular transplant. And inside that you have the talks, like 18 talks of, of doctors that have to be somehow referenced. And if you go on their profile, you have to see these, these talks. So it's complex. It's really, there's really a lot going on and people have to find that information easily and have to uh, be able to act upon that. And this might get even more extreme if you think of things like multi, um, multilinguality. So in, in Switzerland, we maybe have two or, three uh, two or three languages, but if you do events for the uh, European Union, you will have 18, 19 languages. How do you handle that data? This is an application for foreign exchange traders. Um, that's a lot of data that, is, that looks really similar to us, but to them it makes a difference uh, if uh, which currency pairs you have and what, what, uh, what um, rates they're on. So if it's all the same currency pair, it's irritating, and if the rates don't match or not, are not really realistic, they're irritated as well. We use that to test. So if you have a foreign exchange trader sitting in a user test and he sees data that doesn't make sense, the test will be flawed. It will be hard to, to get good results because the, the, the participant is totally distracted from data that isn't, that isn't um, realistic. And this is also very much domain specific data. I mean, these, these rates, they are sort of realistic, but when I made the tests, they were never realistic, just exact on that day. And they were irritated that even then, like, eh? what? <laughs> what happened from <laughs> half an hour ago till now? Why did it drop to, to two cents? So no, no, that's fake data. Ah, okay. So it looked realistic to enough to make them like think, hey, wait a minute. That was different a half an hour ago. So, fake it till you make it. I fake a lot of data, uh, but it has to be credible. That's the point. It has to be so realistic that it might be mistaken for, for the real thing. And the thing is, I fake it uh, without having to be attached to the real system. So this here, it, the, this data comes, comes from, uh, from, in this case, from a YAML file where I just have rates in there. Um, I have two ways to attach data to my prototypes. I use YAML or uh, uh, Google Spreadsheets where I can just pump in tons of data into my prototypes. Um, and you have to be clear about what is good prototype data. Now, this is a, a prototype, uh, an older prototype. Um, we did about um, uh, what, uh, securities, uh, division. And these securities, uh, they, have, they have names here, and they have a, a rate and a, a currency. Actually, the real data looked like this. These were the names, the real names of, the, of, of, uh, of those securities. So we thought we were taking something, oh, let's not take lorem ipsum, let's take data, like so people can make sense of it. But actually, what they want to have make sense of would have been this. So if you don't take the proper data, this happens. If this is your design and this is your data, boom. <coughs> okay. Things you have to fake. 
<laughs> um, realistic data, like it has to be, it has to look real. Fake user roles, fake an authentication layer. That's really important that people can log in, log in into a fake system and use, um, use the functions that are assigned to their role. And this is a, 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 an important task for, uh, for prototyping in the sense of um, how do you design a prototype that doesn't have to be duplicated just because you have multiple roles. So this is a very important part of prototyping is making sure that you that your prototypes are not don't are not redundant, don't have too much duplication. State. So give the illusion that the prototype remembers stuff. It actually does remember, but only as long as the session goes and if you restart the prototype session, it should be reset. And, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, now, data layers are, there are, there are different variations on what is a data layer. The, the most simplest form of data layer is if you have just variables. Variables for, I don't know, uh, dates, usernames, um, the, even the project name, stuff like that. That is just key value pairs that you can uh, use in your prototypes. That's the most basic form of data layer you can have. The second is sessions. So you have like data that, that persists through the screens that you can um, reuse on different screens that you can uh, that allows you to, to simulate the whole chain of events. So you have your event website, you, you have your sessions, you add a session in the prototype, and in your session list, if you reload the session list, the new session shows up. That's persistent data. The highest form and the most complex form is data sets. That's complex or, or a lot of data. So can you simulate 200, 2,000 news entries? How do you do that? Still separating your content from your design in a way that you don't go crazy when you look at, your, at the stuff you did. Now you're probably thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, how does how does he do that? And uh, I use a, a, a prototyping tool I built myself. Um, I started doing that a few years ago, uh, right right after the Swiss um, Swiss Agency for Development and Co uh, Cooperation. That was like the the ignition to 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 working on that. And I often get the approach, well, you know, it's HTML and CSS and JavaScript and some, some parts of PHP. Isn't that extremely, extremely slow compared to stuff like Axure or Balsamic, or, you know, the, the classic prototyping tools. And I said, well, okay, uh, I'll run a test. I'll do a benchmark. It's totally, not scientific because it's just me that did it. I mean, we should have like uh, multiple people doing it and s compare them. But it roughly it roughly showed what what what, uh, what mattered. The assignment was this: a uh, uh, small application for uh, the Canton Graubünden where you could see um, like the. The holiday resorts, Arosa, Flimslach, Falera, uh, Lenzerheide, St. Moritz. And that's the, the, the main page. And you have two screens, the, the detail page, and you have a light box. Just uh, like, we're like four drawings. 
uh, a very small, very rudimentary prototype. It worked in itself. It was maybe not really, um, not really realistic. I mean, those people will probably hate to work together, but let's do that for the sake of benchmarking. Okay, I drew, I drew um, the, the basis on paper, and I even made a uh, prototype on paper prototype, so I can go through the prototype. And then I did um, a benchmark using different two tools. Uh, I stopped time and looked what worked and what, what happened. So, um, the tools I used was Balsamic, the first thing, Axure, and the, the tool I use, uh, Protostrap. Um, short thing on Protostrap, it's, it's an open source project uh, that was started in when I was working at Leap, and is still active. I if I if I hadn't given this talk, I would have prepared the the, the newest release. It's almost ready. Uh, there is only documentation missing, as usual. Uh, <laughs> and what it can do is it is based on Bootstrap, so it can do everything that Bootstrap can. Uh, it has some additional patterns that are not included in Bootstrap, like a very smart uh, select menu that you can uh, attach a live search to it, or uh, default things like um, toggle buttons and, and uh, uh, type ahead that was taken out of Bootstrap, things like that. It has a data layer, so you can really easily attach any Google spreadsheets to it, um, or do it directly in, in YAML. That's also possible if you if you inclined to. And it has pers persistent data, so every data you load into the prototype stays there and can be changed until you reload the prototype. So there is this renew prototype session that chucks everything out of the session and reloads it. Uh, it is ready for multilinguality. It, it, it has a lot of stuff that you need for high-end stuff. And um, yeah, it, there is a learning curve, but you can do stuff. Uh, oh, there is an authentication layer. So just by putting a, an input field with the name login and submitting that, you're logged in. So. Testing that is really easy. Like, okay, the user then, the, the prototype has, has then a, a, an, an accessible variable called is logged in, and uh, you can act upon that. So this is, this is what happened. I looked at the time and at complexity and Abstracting for, from, the, from the benchmark, uh, I found out that, okay, with Balsamic, you're really quick illustrating things. But, but, it doesn't get really complex. So, passing data from one screen to the other just won't happen. Okay, so there's just even, even having a, a, a smart cursor or being device ready for, for different devices is really painful. Um, so that, that will not work. You won't get far with Balsamic. That's the manager's tool. Like, okay, I want to illustrate something quickly. Axure gets you f f further, very much. Um, and stops when it comes to data. Just when it, when it gets interesting, actually just stops. There is another prototyping tool, just in mind, Prototyper, which is slightly more advanced. Um, uh, yeah, uh, 
but it's the same with prototyper. It's really complex, like very simple things like passing a value, a key value from one page to the other, which is like an inherent part of the web, is super complex in these tools. So passing a variable from one page to the other in the web is, is trivial. And here it's like a major brain task. <laughs> and Protostrap, you, you really need a lot of time, you, you really need a lot of time for less complex stuff. That's true. But it scales. That means it doesn't, the, 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 the time you use doesn't, doesn't rise uh, exponentially. It rises linearly. So you use extremely a lot of data, not so much a problem. You use complex uh, data handling structure, not so much a problem. So this is what, what it should be. It should be linear. It should be, that's, that's how things can scale. If it's exponential, it doesn't scale, okay? I made a tool comparison. Like whenever, whenever people have this prototyping tool du jour, they go, oh yeah, you know, Mecca or whatever. I go through this list. Okay, can you do templates? Like parts that you can reuse in different segments of your prototype. Can you use data? Like variables or, or more? Can you use large data? No, variables is, is below. Data is like, um, like structured data, not only key value pairs. Large data is a lot of it, like really a lot of it. Um, does it have a session? Can you test it on different devices? Is it, does it, does it have some responsive uh, mechano that, that allows that? Do you have a graphic user interface? And can you reuse the stuff you do actually later in development? And I go through this list and Mostly, mostly when I'm here or here, I don't bother anymore because nah, it's not worth it. And yeah. Um, think about that when you, when you, when next time you hear about the framework, you say, oh, that's the newest shit. Okay. Now I want to show you a few patterns for doing stuff. And surprisingly, uh, I, I realized that a lot of people, when they see them, they say, oh, duh, duh. but when they have to come up with, with a solution for the problem, they wouldn't, they, wouldn't, um, they wouldn't find that. So let's say you have a list of, you have a table, a list of uh, entries with, let's say, 10 parameters, how to make a flexible search, or uh, how do you filter these parameters? Uh, how do you filter this data with, uh, with these 10 parameters in an easy way? Uh, no, I mean, you can't do this. Um, I will show you. Th these are, uh, the, the Beamer uh, fades it out. These are search fields. You just have your columns, and below each column, there's a search field. And uh, it's really, users just get it. They, they instantly understand what it means because of the, of the mapping. So, okay, if this is a column, then this has to have a f some, some meaning. And it needn't perfectly work in the prototypes, but the users uh, instantly use it the right way. So um, it should, okay. Now you can, uh, you can look for Nashville and the, uh, the list just gets shorter when you look for Nashville. And that's a very easy way to, to filter stuff um, because users don't have to think about finding the parameter they have to to look for because it's it's there. So you use the, the the actual display to help
helping them filter stuff. Okay, this works for a very, uh, for, for a short set of parameters. What if you have like 80 fields, 80 parameters? That's not so cool anymore. Um, and the way you do that is you say, okay, let's just make the user pick the parameters that are important. And the, the, the pattern is you have a parameter, you have an operator, and you have a value. And you, you look for the parameter. This is done in searchable dropdowns. So you have a dropdown that you can search. So if I look for company, I start to type in company and slowly it emerges. So you can, you can select your, your dropdown, your, your parameters. You can add new, new ones. So you can combine parameters. And you can add filter logic. Surprisingly, the easiest way to add filter logic is to have them write it. That's much more efficient than drag and drop interface where you do pattern, where, where you do groups with the, it's, it's much simpler. Every, every, every uh, combo has an, uh, a, a number and you can do stuff here. If you have no, if you have no brackets, the brackets are implicit, like until the first, uh, the first, um, uh, what, is, what are these called? The first operator that is different. So and, uh, one and two will be one bracket, or three is then is the second. Um, if you would have, if you want, would want that two or three is a group, you would have to set brackets here. Okay. So, um, now let's have the demo. Okay, I fill in the, the company and um, then I, I add uh, a group. I open the, the drop down. I look for the hotel and add that. And you see how the interface gradually expands. So that, and I say, okay, add me some logic and I can change the logic. Boom. This is, very fast, a very fast way to find, to find records. Bulk editing data. So uh, let's assume you have these 80 rows of, rows of data and you want to assign uh, or you want to change uh, something for all the people that um, live in Hotel Belvedere and are Spanish or something. So you need all these people and, no, no, sorry, sorry. You, you select the people, sorry, I was mistaken. You, you select the people, you want to do something and then you say, okay, I want to change, for all these people I selected, I want to change the emergency contact. That's the thing, yeah? All the Spanish people living in Hotel Belvedere, let me place the emergency contact and emergency phone number. So they have it in their conference app and if they have a problem, they know, okay, I can call this person. So. The first thing is you would select the entries. Now, um, this is just a list and I can go through the paging. And the important part is it remembers the selection over the paging. So, huh? It keeps the selection if you page 
through the pages. And then you can select the properties you want to change. So you take the emergency contact and then say, okay, edit. You can do whatever you want. And there you go. That's a, a fast, that's quite a fast way to, to change any data in a very, very fast way. So parts remembering selection is also like a pattern that really helps if you have a lot of stuff and if you have to perform different actions on it. So you, know, you don't only say, hey, uh, let's, let's uh, configure the emergency contact as such and such, but also uh, maybe you wanna write an email. So you, you will have to repick those people. So keep the selection. Uh, the searchable multi-select, where you can go through a list and mark the elements you want to use in your action. Okay, and the next pattern is assigning groups. Let's say you have your conference and it has only like uh, participants and have only like 10 fields. If you, if you would want to group that, you probably would do something like uh, um, radio buttons for the groups you have. You, you probably will, will not have a lot of groups. And defining 10 groups is not a lot of work. But if you have like 80 fields, that's more complex. You don't want to go through 80 drop downs to, to select a group for each element. And what you can do is use, uh, of course, use the interface, use the display, use how things are shown to make groups. So um, you can't really see, well, this is personal info. It's a group here. And you can just add groups. I go, uh, start the video, that's, um, so I, you, you see this is a really long list and okay, you wanna add groups. You add a group, you name the group and then you just drag the group where you need it. And everything below that group belongs to that group. It could be even smoother if you add it, like add a group here button, but um, that would increase noise in the interface. So I, I went for, okay, each group can reopen a new group. So that's, that's a very, a very non-window pop-up uh, uh, thing to do, like just use, use the display of, of, of the order of things. You will probably have to order stuff for display anyway. So why not use that also for the groups? Um, oh, <laughs> shit, I forgot to write the recap. Uh, the recap is data. So, <laughs> oh man, it's embarrassing. Uh, the recap, uh, yeah, use data-driven design, it's good for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's all I have, uh, thank you. If you have questions, yep. Uh, reusing your prototype in actual development, if you've got any points on that. Um, it happens. <laughs> some, some should you do it in the first place or sh should you scrap your prototype and start over? Um, it, it really depends how, how you plan to implement your prototype. I mean, I just use Bootstrap with jQuery, but if you're going to develop something in, I don't know, uh, Angular or, or, or something, that means, yeah, well, you probably are going to pick 
stuff um, and and uh, reuse it there. Also, uh, to be honest, for you will probably stone me for this, but I don't care about SAS or less. I don't just don't give a shit because it it makes me slow, um, and it's not it's not important. It my prototypes don't have to be maintained. That's a very luxury. It's, that's luxury. I can just write the ugly ass code I want, and it has to work. It has to illustrate the point. Of course, having been uh, in a decent development company, uh, I behave when I code, so it's not too bad. But I don't have to. I don't have to like to be the 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 the. the very rectal about my code, uh, but yeah, you can. Re I mean, you can reuse it. You can reuse at least part of it, or you can, you can look up in the code. How did I do that? Um, things you can't do with Azure or, or, or Balsamic. Other questions? Um, so, having worked on a on an application that also visualizes uh, financial market data yeah. and having our initial design crashed multiple times by actual data. Yeah. Um, um, my question is, um, how do you deal with data that you don't fully understand? Because I, I see that those are client projects, so you yeah. there's a certain uh, domain of data yeah. that you don't know much about yeah. and it probably takes you a lot of time to yeah. get into that. Do you work with experts in the field yes. or? <laughs> yes, that's the only way. Um, the thing is, after I I do the prototypes, people want to assume me as like <laughs> data analyst or something. Because I, I really get into that and I want to know stuff. And that's, that's what I find so cool about this job, that you get to see stuff you otherwise wouldn't. And it's really fascinating to talk about these people and to understand what differences make to them. And uh, the first versions of the prototype were crashed also, but in, in, a very, in a very subtle way, like, oh, well, it looks okay, but actually when we use it, um, it should do something slightly different. And then you start to understand what, what matters to them, and that's, that's the point. So it really matters to them uh, when they have to, they have uh, like requests for quotes. So they have to, someone wants to buy a million dollars in Swiss francs and they have to say how much a dollar costs if you, if you buy that. They, when they type in the number, they only care about the second, the, the two second last digits. So if you focus on that field, only the two second last digits have to be selected on focus. So they just can they do everything with the keyboard. It's like and they want to be fast. So seconds matter. So the change from hey, I want to have the select I've on focus, I don't just want to have everything selected, but only the sec the, the the two last uh, digits. That's that was like Huge improvements to them. To us, it's like, Bleh. but to them, it was like, yeah, nobody has that. We we need that. That's fast. That just, I don't have to uh, like curse around with with uh, with the cursor. I just can use, can enter the the, the, the digits, and that's it. Hi, uh, considering, the, considering that uh, we're just prototyping here, uh, when do we stop a pursuit, a madness of getting real data? Because the real data is a very vague word. It includes a lot of things depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. And you're prototyping for, let's say, two days to show something to someone. Yeah. You don't really need real data all the way. Y you, you have to deal with scripts of all origins around the world. You have to deal with RTL languages. You have to deal with people uploading uh, logs in a note-taking note application, and you don't expect everything. So when do you stop? What do you mean by real data? It has to stop somewhere. Because um, you'll never have it 
no, it, it, it has to start somewhere and, and it never stops. That's true. Um, <laughs> sorry, I, I can only give you a very generic answer uh, as soon as possible. And the, the key is to, to sort of find the, the triangle between data that is crucial, um, data that is in a specific format, in an expected specific format, and data that has uh, a specific um, volume. So these, these things you have to find out. And you will, fi you will get answers, you will get, you will get, um, you will get response from the client if you ask the right questions. And before I start prototyping, of course, I, I make a lot of, um, a lot of uh, research. I ask, well, what do you need? What, what do these people have to perform? And if I have the tasks, I can, I can ask them, well, how does the, the data look like? Is, is, it, is it this presenting data I assume might be correct? And you have to involve the client into this discussion really soon. Don't assume, don't assume stuff and always check your assumptions. Like really challenge your assumptions, challenge the, the, the client's assumptions on, on any, anything. Uh, sometimes they just want, want to get rid of you and yeah, yeah, that's, that's okay. And then it doesn't work in the tests or they don't know or they assume then stuff themselves. So start early, um, focus on, on tasks and make models of the content according to the task that, that, that has to be fulfilled. I am the man standing between the beers. <laughs> so one last question, <laughs> otherwise we wrap it up. Okay, thank, thank you, you very Mimi. much.